and welcome everybody to the March talk of the Berlin Abbey Methods Colloquium. My name is Tolbo Glatz, I'm a scientific researcher at the Institute of Public Health at Charité and we organize these talks every first Wednesday of the month and we also have journal clubs or book clubs every third Wednesday of the month. I'm not doing this alone, and we also have some people helping behind the scenes. So we have Chisato Ito, Tobias Kurt, and Megan Forrest here with us today as well. Yeah, so with this out of the way, we can transition into the talk of today. And yeah, now it's my great pleasure to introduce Jeremy Lebrecht from Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Jeremy holds a Master of Science and a PhD in Epidemiology from McGill University in Montreal, and he's currently the leader of the Causal Inference Group at Erasmus Medical Center. His talk today has the intriguing title, Time Exists So That Everything Doesn't Happen at Once, and I'm happy to take it, uh, to pass it over to you. Great. Thank you. Um... Yeah, and so I was thought I'd start off say a little bit about myself. So yeah, I'm assistant professor of epidemiology, leader of the causal inference group, and I actually did my PhD with your previous speaker, uh, Jay Kaufman. But uh, yeah, so today I guess I changed my title a little bit. Uh, it's exact. It means the same thing, but the wordings. Uh, so the only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. And somebody's already talked to me about uh, the movie. Every what is it? Everything, everywhere, all at once. Uh, and I did try and decide whether I was going to go with that title or this one. Uh, this is actually an Einstein quote, and it actually per it perfectly encapsulates what I want to talk about today, which is why I went with this one. I want to start with a little story that maybe some of you are familiar with. So there's a guy who always in the story, the guy's drunk, and he's under a streetlight. He's looking for his wallet. <clears throat> and a police officer comes along, and he says, you know, what's going on here? Is everything okay? And he says, yeah, I lost my wallet. I'm trying to find it. So the police officer spends a couple of minutes trying to help him. And he's like, wait, like, you know, we've searched this whole area. We can't find your wallet. Are you sure this is where you lost your wallet? And he says, no, no, I lost it way over there in the park, but I can't see there. I can only see here where the light is. And so it's supposed to be a little bit silly because for to find the wallet, you need two things. You need to be able to see, you need to be able to sense it somehow, and you need to obviously be in the right place. Otherwise, the probability of finding the wallet is zero. Um, and I'm telling you this because I find sometimes we're doing this in science without recognizing it. And I'm going to start with a bit of a strange example from physics. So I don't know, I'm not a physicist. Uh, I read like these, you know, books for a general audience just for fun. And I came across this thing that I thought was really interesting. Um, so it's called the ADS-CFT correspondence. If I say anything technical, you can just forget it because it's just, you know, the, the idea behind it is what's important here. And so this is important because for a long time, people have been trying to bring together gravity and quantum mechanics. And it basically doesn't work because in my understanding, if you plug the two together, the math just explodes. You get infinities, nothing makes sense. So people can't find this theory of quantum gravity. In the late 90s, this guy, Juan Maldacena, discovered that basically you can describe quantum gravity in this place called anti de Sitter space uh, using a, a different kind of math that we do know how to do. So the CFT math here, which you see on the slide, uh, we know how to do that. And we can, through this, like the best definition or the best description is like a mathematical dictionary. Uh, we can take the math in CFT and apply it to anti de Sitter space, and then figure, and then we sort of get an idea of, okay, this is how gra quantum gravity would work in anti de Sitter space. And this has been hugely successful. Thousands, maybe tens of thousands of papers, source of inspiration of how quantum systems might relate to each other. But there's one problem, that this is not at all the real world. So anti de Sitter space that happens has almost none of the qualities not none, but like there's just, it differs in so many ways. Space curves in a different way. It has a different kind of gravity. It has five dimensions instead of R4. Um, so this famous physicist says the, the system that we've understood is the furthest from observable physical reality. And think about this, tens of thousands of papers are, you know, written about this, and yet it is not at all what's going on in reality. So I just remade the cartoon, you know, to say the light is, we're looking in a specific place, anti-decitter space, and is this where you lost your theory of quantum gravity? 
no, I lost it basically in the real world, but I can't, I don't know how to do the math in the real world. So I'm just gonna do it here instead. Um, and so isn't this, to some extent, the same thing as the guy who lost his wallet. He's looking at a place where he won't find the right answer. Not quite, right? Uh, he could at least here find a, a hint of where his wallet is or where what the real theory of quantum gravity would look like. Maybe he finds like a receipt in his pocket that says, you know, you went to this restaurant, you can retrace his steps and then find his wallet. Uh, and when I read this, I thought, this is, a, this is really silly. We would never do this in causal inference, right? We would never imagine that our data were generated by a mechanism where there was no confounding, you know, where we knew perfectly the structure um, and we're not making any uh, unreasonable assumptions, you know, unreasonably strong assumptions. And then I thought about it and I thought, uh-oh, this is exactly what we do in causal inference. We look under the street light of our causal assumptions, conditional exchange. Really, this is just you know one set of assumptions you could use, positivity consistency. We assume all of these very strong assumptions because we don't know what to do, right? When we're faced with the real world where we have unmeasured confounding, where we have no measurement error, I'm uh, sorry, where we have unmeasured confounding and we do have measurement error, we don't know how to specify our models correctly. Uh, we, you know, a lot of times people don't even check positivity assumptions. We're doing the same thing as the physicists in the quantum gravity example. We are looking under the light. We say, this is the only place we can look. We don't know what to do when all these uh, quant, you know, not quantum, <laughs> all these causal assumptions are violated. And this is leading up to my point here, but also this is why now when I see the, the, the causal inference literature, I get a little bit more excited now when I see things like partial identification or you know, this proximal learning, uh, anything where we're trying to figure out how do we get information out of the system when these strong assumptions aren't met. Um, rather than, and, and there's nothing wrong with this, but when I see people who say, you know, we've made these 12 very strong assumptions and now we can estimate this, crazy mediation parameter that, you know, that has very specific interpretation. That's, you know, I have a lot of uh, respect for that because I can't do that work as much. It's beyond my technical abilities. Um, but I get the feeling sometimes that we're stuck in the like world where we're making a lot of assumptions that we know are not, is not the real world, right? We know in definitely in observ observational data and often in experimental data, Conditional exchangeability also won't necessarily hold. So this is just applying it now to causal inference that, you know, using the causal assumptions as our light, you know, is this where you lost your data? You know, in a world where you have no unmeasured confounding, everything is perfectly measured. Um, no, I lost my data in the real world, but I don't know how to come to any conclusion unless I make all of these assumptions. So really we're doing the same thing. Um, which will now bring me to back to the title. As you can see here, you can read perfectly well, I assume. Uh, this is just a little joke uh, because, you know, if I put all of, if time didn't exist and I put all of the words on top of each other, it's basically trying to read them all at the same exact time. It's unintelligible. You have no idea what this says, unless you were clever enough to think ahead and think that's what I would do. But this says, the only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. Um, and this is going to be, I'm, in one sense, epidemiologists pride themselves on being really good at uh, thinking about time. My, uh, my PhD supervisor, Jay Kaufman, who was here last month, taught me that every time you get a chance to take, make a little joke about economists, you have to go for it. Um, you know, this is something we pride ourselves over economists about, that we take, you know, a lot of pride, we can estimate um, you know, joint effects on different time points. Uh, we're good at like drawing these crazy DAGs. Like this is very simple compared to some of the DAGs you can see in the literature when there are exposures, mediators, different confounders for the exposure and the mediator. Everything's time varying. There's a million arrows. We can pride ourselves on being really good at thinking about time. But I'm going to argue that sometimes when we're not forced to thinking about to think about time, we do act as though everything happens at once. We act as though we can take an event that happens over a large period of time and crunch it down into one variable on our DAG. So 
I'm going to start here basically with just one edge of a DAG. So here, you know, we have one variable A, which is generally in my examples is going to be the exposure and Y is the outcome. And I put a computer chip in the background because I'm trying to think about this now the way that Judea Pro would, right? Computer scientist, uh, if you draw a DAG like this, it's very clear what this means to Judea Pearl. And it's sort of the same way if you've ever simulated data, it's the same thing, right? You create the variable A, and then as a function of A, you create Y. There's the, the edge here is showing a transfer of pure information. There's nothing that's happening between these two things, right? There's, there's no intermediate variables. It's just the information is going from A and it's going from Y. That works perfectly well in the Judea Pearl, in the, in the computer science world, but we don't live in that world, right? So now take a couple of seconds here just to think, you know, I just picked this example out of the air. You know, if we measure smoking at one time point and we want to estimate what's gonna be the effect on time to death, I'm not asking you to think about confounders here or anything now. I'm thinking, I'm asking you to think about all of the mechanisms between these two things, smoking at time zero and time to death. How does the information get from smoking, we measure a specific time, to later on, you know, what the, the, the time that they're going, a person is going to die, a person on our data set maybe? How does information get transferred? This is just, I mean, this is a huge oversimplification, but I, I made sort of two roots here. One of them is that the smoking, you know, smoking at a later time point can have an effect on death. So Basically, smoking can act as a mechanism for itself. If you smoke at time zero, you're more likely to smoke at time one, more likely to smoke at time two. And that might be smoking at time two or time I here that has an effect on death. So there's all this mechanism that goes through the variable itself towards the outcome. And also it could be through some other mechanism. Maybe smoking at time zero has an effect on some other mediator, some lung function or something like that. Uh, and that goes on through time and has uh, an effect on the time that you die. Uh, and obviously you could probably draw, I, I don't even know how big of a number to say here. You can draw um, many of these paths. These paths can be related to each other. You know, I could have an arrow from S at time one to mediator time two, all of these things. This is all happening, right, in the real world. When we draw a very simple dag of smoking at T0 on the top here and time to death, um, we're greatly simplifying what's going on in between. And if we take the time to think about what's going on, I'm gonna show you that there are some little tricks or not tricks, but uh, some things that can happen that we wouldn't necessarily expect if we just had the very simple arrow. So of course, this is just bringing me back to my metaphor of the light here that we are looking in a very simple uh, universe where we're looking, you know, we think that the information from smoking at time zero gets transmitted directly to time to death, but, the reality that's outside of our, of our lamp light uh, is much more complicated and has all of these intermediate steps. So I'm gonna have three examples here. Uh, we'll see if I have time to get through all three. I put the most boring one last. So if we have to skip it, that's fine. Uh, so I'm gonna start with this very simple DAG, uh, which I probably draw one of these every single day, I think. Um, there's not a, there's definitely, I don't think there's a day goes by where I wouldn't draw a DAG at some point during the day. Uh, as maybe sad that might be. Um, and so let's just break, you know, break this down a little bit here. So I'm gonna take this quote from, I'm gonna talk a lot about Tyler Vanderweel here, not because I'm trying to pick on him. A lot of the, I think almost all of the things that I'm gonna talk about today, if that he knows them, just sometimes the, the words aren't careful enough necessarily to, to pick up on some of these things. So he says, you control for, oh, there's the, the thing in the way there, but you control for each covariate that is a cause of the exposure or of the outcome or of both. So this is from a paper that's supposed to help you select your confounders. So here we have no problems. Um, this is clear, C is a variable that causes the exposure and the outcome. Um, so we should definitely adjust for this. And then the second part says, exclude from this set any variable known to be an instrumental variable. Instrumental variable is just a variable that only causes the outcome through the exposure. It has no other direct effect on the outcome uh, except through its effect on the exposure. So as I've drawn here, Z affects A at time zero, which then affects Y at 
uh, t equals 10. And if I blocked a at time zero here, z would not have any effect on y. So this would be known as an instrumental variable. And I'm going to do one little thing here to hopefully convince you that we should, contrary to what Tyler Vanderweel here is saying, that we should adjust for z. And I've already given you a lot of hints of what I'm going to do here. Um, but all I have to do is say, this variable z, yes, it influences the exposure at t times zero, but it also has an independent effect on the exposure at a different time point. So I put the a at time five here in gray just to emphasize that this is something we haven't measured. But now, if I'm asking you what's the effect, if I want to know the effect of a at time zero on y at time 10, do I have to adjust for z? The answer is yes, now you do, because Z has now opened a backdoor path between your exposure at time zero and the outcome at time 10. If we did not adjust for Z, we would get the wrong answer for the effect of A at time zero and Y at time 10. So why is there this confusion? Well, it's, it's a little bit confusing because Z here is an instrumental variable when A is considered as a whole. So for A, the variable A at every time point here, Z only influences the outcome through A. So if you think of A as a whole, Z is an instrumental variable. But here we're only asking the question about A at time zero. And so for A at time zero, Z is no longer an instrumental variable. It has an influence on the outcome through another path than through A at time zero. Therefore, we would need to adjust for Z in order to get the effect of A times zero on Y at time 10. One little interesting thing about this is that if all you wanted to know was, and this, this is still, this is a very oversimplified world as well. I haven't even put in any more uh, confounders here. And a, a lot of times I'll be emitting confounders just because the arrows get crazy. One little interesting thing here is that the null hypothesis of whether A has an effect on any time uh, and Y on any time is still testable even if you don't adjust for Z. It's because Z can only be a confounder if A at T equals five affects the outcome. So this is just an interesting little thing that pops out of this when you're, when you're thinking about this. So let me give you a couple of uh, real world examples. Uh, so this is, Imagine you have measured BMI at some time point zero, and you want to know what's the effect of BMI on some body image disorder at 10 years later, let's say. You might say, I, have, I, I know about some genetic variants, some single nucleotide polymorphisms that are related to BMI that you know, mechanistically, it wouldn't make any sense for them to have an effect on body image disorder later, you know, through any other mechanism except for BMI. Like I, I, I know how these SNPs work uh, and there's no reason to think that they would have any effect on body image disorder except through BMI. So if you thought about them that way, you might think, okay, this is an instrumental variable. So I don't have to worry about adjusting for this type of thing. But the problem is that, and there is, I've done some research on this myself, and there are other people who have as well, that these genetic variants don't have, it's not like they set your BMI at one time point, and then they don't have an effect anymore throughout the rest of your life. They continue to affect the phenotype differently at different points in time. Um, so here's just one example uh, using, I think this is the uh, FTO gene or locate, uh, locus. Showing that you know this, the the this SNP has a very like almost zero effect at uh, very early on, and then has a much larger effect at age twenty, and then has a smaller effect. In some data sets, it goes down to zero, and later on, um, this is you know you have to make some assumptions when you're assuming that this is that you're you're that the, the effect of this SNP is actually time varying, like there could be selection bias in play here. But generally, you know, there's, I think there's enough evidence to, see, to show here that this SNP has an effect at different effects at different time points. So basically it's following the DAG here that I drew up on the top. So if you believe that you have a SNP like this, where it affects BMI at the time point where you've measured the BMI and also measures, uh, affects it down the road later on, you should adjust for a variable like this. 
So this again goes contrary. Most people would think, you know, especially in Mendelian randomization, most people, you know, use these types of genes as instrumental variables. But in the case like this, it's not anymore. It has an effect on the exposure later on. I'll say that for this example, this might be one where I wouldn't lose too much sleep if I didn't adjust for, for this SNP, probably because the BMI at time zero and time five is probably much more related to each other due to the horizontal arrow rather than the, the other arrow from the SNP down to BMI. So it's in a sense, it's like any other type of confounding where you have to think about the relative strengths of the arrow to think about how important of a confounder it would be. And in this case, I actually, it probably wouldn't be a very strong one, but it's a nice one to illustrate the example. Another example would be from uh, an RCT. So this one's maybe a little bit more interesting. Imagine we've randomized someone, whether or not to get uh, uh, PSA screening at time zero. This is, you know, to look for prostate cancer. Um, and so, you know, we randomize them at time zero. Not everybody does uh, what, you know, there's non-adherence. So some people who are randomized to be screened don't get screened and vice versa. I'm, uh, I know some people at Erasmus who work with this type of data. And now imagine that that not the, the, the fact of, you know, because this is unblinded. These people do not know what they've been, or sorry, they do know what they have been uh, randomized to. You can imagine that maybe, you know, I put time equals five here, but maybe think it's the next year that somebody, regardless of what they did at time zero, could think, oh, remember last year they tried to recruit us for that trial. We didn't go, maybe we should go this year. I don't know who this person's talking to, but, um, you know, so the, the randomization can have an effect not only at time zero, but also at time five. So we have the same structure as before. The interesting thing that pops out here is that if you wanted to ask, uh, so first of all, if you're asking the intention to treat effect here, obviously nothing, uh, you, do, you don't have to worry about this because you're asking about the effect of Z on Y. So you don't have to obviously just for Z, but if you want to start doing something to estimate per protocol effects. You can ask a couple of different per protocol effects here. You can ask a point one to say, look, if we forced everybody to go to the screening at time zero, what would the effect of that have been on the you know, death mortality from prostate cancer at time 10? In that case, you do have to adjust for Z because the randomization itself is functioning as a confounder, um, a backdoor path from PSA t equals zero to Z to T equals five, and then to the outcome Y. So you would have to adjust for randomization in this case, but you don't have to if you're asking about the joint effect at the two time points, because essentially if you're asking about intervening at the two time points, you've blocked the effect of Z on the outcome. And so Z is no longer uh, a confounder. And this is just to pull from uh, a paper about guidelines on how to estimate uh, effects in pragmatic trials. And it just says one option for validly estimating the per protocol effect in a pragmatic trial with a point intervention. So if we're only intervening at t equals zero is to directly adjust for baseline prognostic factors that are also predictors of adherence. So Z here is not, uh, you know, we would hope that randomization is not a prognostic Factor. It is definitely a predictor of adherence, but it's not a prognostic factor. Uh, so it's not included in here. And to be fair, like this is not the type of thing that is on a lot of people's minds. My point of this talk is to try and get people to think about these more. So, and it would only come up in the point, uh, in the case where you're thinking about intervening only at time zero. And if you're not having um, epidemiologic nightmares yet, I can replace. A at time five with just any old mediator, anything that's on the path uh, between A at time zero and the outcome at time 10. And you get the same exact behavior, which leads me to say that if you want to adjust, if you want to adjust for all the back, uh, unmeasured or all the confounding between the exposure at time zero and the outcome at time 10, you have to adjust for all the common causes of a zero at time a at time zero and every variable on every path between a at time zero and y at time ten. 
Now, before you go home and stop sleeping uh, over this, um, it depends on the context, how strong these, these confounding paths would, will be. Uh, in the case for um, the, the A path, so the upper one, I think that in a lot of cases, you could make the argument that whatever confounding is being caused by a variable like CA is probably, uh, you know, if, if the variables are very strongly correlated to each other, like if the effect of A at time zero is very, you know, if it has a huge influence on what happens at time one, then CA, the, the confounding of CA is not gonna be nearly as strong. But for the mediators on the bottom, I don't know, this is something, Fortunately, I don't do a lot of, or I don't do my own applied research, so I don't worry about these things that much. But I think there might be cases where you might have to worry about these types of um, confounders a lot. Okay, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit, same, same idea, just to show some, some places in the literature where I think people have not been thinking about this as precisely as I'm saying here. So... This is from uh, Tyler Vanderweel's book from 2016. Um, he says here that, you know, there's a whole bunch of assumptions listed in the book. Um, so this is assumption A2.1, no one measured confounding of the treatment outcome relationship. So given what I've told you up to here, what variables do you have to include if you want to make sure there's no unmeasured confounding of the treatment outcome relationship? So the treatment here is A, outcome is Y, how do we control the confounding? So we all agree on C1, but from what I'm telling you, you also need to adjust for C3, right? There's also a backdoor path to Y through C3, from A to C3 to M to Y. So really, if you read this assumption, literally, it's telling you adjust for C1 and C3. This is from his mediation book, so there's also other uh, exchangeability assumptions here. So A2.2 is basically telling you to adjust for C2 and A2.3 is telling you to adjust for C3. And what happens is that if you have read these literally, like I just have, is that if you start going a little bit, you know, where he's telling you, if you want to estimate, for example, a control direct effect, he says you need to have assumption A.2.1, the blue one up top and the green one, which if you know, it implies that you need to adjust for C1, C2, and C3 here, which if you've had a mediation course already, you'll know that that's not actually true. You don't need to adjust for C3 here, but it is implied by the language that's being used in this book. So really, assumption A2.1, you know, should be no unmeasured confounding of the treatment outcome relationship through paths that do not go through M. That's what, and I know this is not like, Tyler Vanderweel knows this. Um, it's just not being careful or extremely precise with the language that leads you to, you know, you, if you read this without having been taught mediation, you might come to the wrong conclusion if you read these things and you knew how to read a DAG that way. And actually, there's one paper I did find where Tyler does say something to, to acknowledge this, but not quite going to the, to the uh, extent of redefining the, the first assumption here. Another little interesting thing is that here um, he says that the assumptions for confounding that are needed to identify direct and indirect effects are stronger than for the total effects. This is what I thought for a long time. I thought this is obviously true because I thought to, if you want to estimate the total effect, you estimate, uh, sorry, you adjust for C1. If you want to estimate the control direct effect, you, S you control for C1 and C2. So the total effect is a subset of the assumptions that you need for the control direct effect. So therefore, the control direct effect has to have stronger assumptions because you require two instead of one, and the, the other one is the same. This is why you know, it was said that control direct effects here in the top require stronger conditions for identification than total causal effects. But that's because it maybe slipped their minds or something like this, that uh, for the control direct effect, you need to adjust for C1 and C2. For the total effect, you need to adjust for C1 and C3, right? 
So C1 is the same assumption. So we can toss that aside. We don't have to worry about that. But then with regards to which of the two um, identification strategies are requiring stronger assumptions, it depends on whether uh, you believe adjusting for C2 or C3 is more feasible. So in general, you can't say what uh, the stronger, which, which of the control direct effect and the total effect require stronger assumptions. All right, so now I'm gonna shift gears and go to a totally different example. Um, all right, example two. So this is work that I did during my postdoc and actually I didn't, I didn't do it the regular way where you start with some work, you know, where I'm gonna show here that if you think about time that you come to these weird conclusions. I didn't work from there and then come to these other the conclusions in example one and example three. I actually started thinking about all these things independently and just kept coming back. I kept seeing, oh wait, this is totally related to the same stuff I was doing during my postdoc. Um, so this is a standard IV setup. I have also drawn this DAG uh, very, very many times in my life. Uh, and it was only when I started working on Mendelian randomization that I realized there's, this is a severe simplification of reality. So in Mendelian randomization, you're using a genetic variant as Z here, as your instrumental variable. And Y you know, can be measured at the end of life, you know, at age 80 or something like that. So there's a lot of time between Z and A, A and Y. Um, so really the DAG that we should have been drawing all along, I dropped C here now for, for simplicity, looks something like this, you know, and here I've only included three time points, but obviously there's an infinite number of time points between conception, which is when your genetic variants are set and whenever the outcome is measured. What you, so the DAG we should really have been working with this whole time should have looked something like this. And I've been mentioning Mendelian randomization, but this is not true only of Mendelian randomization. It's true of any type of instrumental variable analysis. And so the relevant assumption here to, that we're gonna think about is called the exclusion restriction assumption. And I already mentioned it a little bit. It's that the instrumental variable only affects the outcome through its effect on the exposure. So here drawn very simply, Z affects A, A affects Y. Z does not have an independent direct effect on Y. Our exclusion restriction assumption is satisfied. But if we draw the DAG the way that I'm suggesting we do, now we're gonna run into some problems. And I'm gonna say, you know, if we've only measured A1 here, so pretend we haven't measured A0 and A2, now we do have a violation of the exclusion restriction assumption because we are Asking a question about the effect of A1, all of the red paths that I've drawn on here are paths that go from Z to the outcome without passing through A1, the variable that we've measured. So now our exclusion restriction, which is a very important assumption for in instrumental variable analyses is violated. But in the process of thinking through this, I realize there's another problem here because in, especially in Mendelian randomization, because there's so much time between when the gene or the genetic variant is measured and the outcome, people say, we're estimating a lifetime effect. So I thought, okay, they're not actually trying to estimate the effect of A1 here. Even if they've measured the exposure at one time point, they're not asking the question, what is the effect of A1 on Y? They're asking the, uh, the question of what's the effect if I intervened at A throughout the entire, well, from conception until when the outcome was measured. What is that causal effect? So it turns out that you can't actually estimate the, the first one that I mentioned. So you, you, as soon as you have the violation of the exclusion restriction through the red arrows, then that one's gone. You can't do that anymore. But you can actually still estimate the effect of A at all times with this extra assumption that the relationship between Z and A is constant throughout time. And I have a paper which is not yet published, but you can find it on MedArchive that looks at, basically uses real data from the UK Biobank and looks at you know, genetic variants that are often used in Mendelian randomization analyses to see if this is true, that how much the relationship between these genetic variants and the exposure are constant across ages, basically. And the answer is that it really depends on what you're looking at. There are some 
genetic variants that uh, actually do not vary very much. So that's nice for Mendelian randomization, but there are other ones that do. So here's uh, an instrument or a genetic variant that's related to BMI. And you can see that basically from age 40 until age 70, the effect of this uh, genetic variant has gone down by half. So then what I did is just run this thing called um, plasmode simulation, where I used date, real data from the UK Biobank as sort of the first part, and then assumed some exposure windows. I don't really want to get into that topic right now, but basically by assuming different time periods in which the exposure affects the outcome, I can estimate how much bias you would get by using Mendelian randomization. Um, and so it depends on how wide your exposure window is, but you, you can look, you know, even if you look at only the last column here, these are just 10 genetic variants. So you can see that if you have a very long exposure window, your estimate can be biased by 25%, or in this case, it would be biased by 25%. And it ranges from, you know, this genetic variant here in the green, there's almost, there's very little bias. I wouldn't, you know, 8% is not something to lose sleep over. Uh, I guess it depends on the context. Um, then on the other hand, the one just below it now has, you know, 80% bias with confidence intervals that go from 13 to 216. So there's a, there's a potential for very strong bias here. And it's because this was not seen earlier because people did not draw uh, the daglets drawn on the top left here. They didn't think about all of the processes that happen between Z and Y. And I'll, 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 I'll mention that I, I'm not the first one actually to uh, have drawn it like this. Um, there are other papers that, that started with this idea, I feel, but didn't really take it all the way. Maybe because uh, I don't know, they didn't have time, but... So this is just a really interesting case where when you recognize that not everything is happening at once, you can't just draw one A and expect it to capture everything that's going on. You realize that there are biases that I see if I draw time out that I wouldn't see if I pretended like everything happened at once. So now I'm gonna show you something that I've just been thinking about recently um, is that you know by shifting a couple of variables around here, I can easily take this from an instrumental variable setup and go to a mediation setup, right? So I just replace Z with A, A with M, and now I have the exact same type of DAG. And this is something that I've just started thinking through, so I thought I would just mention it here for fun. Um, but now if we recognize that I'm living, you know, I, I'm ignoring all the time issues with A and Y, I'm only talking about uh, the time issues with M here, if I've only measured M at one time point, you know, and let's imagine that's, you know, a very good mediation analysis where there's really, you know, you measure A before M and, and M before Y. So there's, you know, the actual time between A and Y. I mentioned this because people often come to me and say, I have this cross-sectional data and I want to do mediation analysis. But if you've done it right and things are measured throughout time, now I can draw this DAG, right? I can say, well, a doesn't have an influence on the outcome only through M at time one. Like what is special about the time that you measured, right? A could have affected the, the mediator before you measured it, and that could have an impact on the outcome, or it could affect the mediator after you measured the mediator, and that can have an impact on the outcome. If this is the case, what is the indirect effect here? Which question are we trying to answer? I said, all oh, this is my another obsession of mine. It's like, what is the question here? My students are probably sick of me uh, saying it so much. But it does, it happens a lot that when that a lot of disagreements that we have sort of, uh, this is, uh, I shouldn't go on this tangent, go away once you recognize, okay, we're actually trying, we're talking about two different causal questions here. So um, here you might have some kind of confusion if you weren't thinking about the same indirect effect, because you can define it here in two ways. It's kind of like the same way we defined uh, the instrumental variable in one of two ways. We can say, I'm interested in the indirect effect, uh, the effect of Y that only passes through M1, the specific time point that I measured, that's the only thing I'm interested in. That's my indirect effect. But who's to stop anybody from saying, well, th there's nothing special about time one. I'm interested in the effect on Y that passes through M at any time point. I wanna hold the mediator constant at every time point, not just at one time point. 
And these are different causal questions that have different answers. And uh, yeah, I've never seen, uh, I haven't seen anybody uh, talk about that yet. And I, and I don't know, I mean, the, there's no right answer. There are two questions that you can answer in different ways. Um, I might, like I said, example three is kind of the more boring one. Um, so I might go over it a little bit quickly. This is also some things that I've been thinking about. There have been a couple of papers that have come out recently about how to think about cross-sectional studies. And they're also, I think it's really important to think about what your actual question is. I don't, the, the papers that have come out, I don't think deal with that uh, enough. But I let, I've been thinking about the cross-sectional study because to some extent, this is the design that takes time the least seriously, right? Now I'm saying like, imagine you measured your, your confounders, your exposure and your outcome all at the exact same time, right? Like people say, you know, some things affect each other on a very short time scale. I'm saying exactly the same time. So I can't draw any arrows, but direct arrows between these things, right? If I measure them truly cross-sectionally, none of these can affect each other directly. So if I'm asking the effect of A1 on Y1, at the same cross-sectionally, the answer is zero. I don't have to do any math. I don't have to collect any data. I already know the effect is zero. It's impossible for A1 to have an effect on Y1. So what are we doing when we're doing cross-sectional studies? Well, what we're relying on, and I'm, I will add that I, I'm discovering that people use cross-sectional in different ways. So I'm using it in a very specific way here. If you're thinking about it in a different way, Maybe it doesn't apply to the way you're thinking about it, but I'm, I'm using it here as literally as possible that this is really a cross-sectional study. The relationship between A1 and Y1 in a cross-sectional study is only gonna be due, I'm leaving confounding to the side here for a second, it's only gonna be due to the relationship uh, if A ha in the past has a relationship to Y1, or you know I'm keeping things simple and only having one Y time point here, but it could also be through Y at previous time points. So this is how these two things are correlated. And if this is your real data structure, even though you have no confounders, you cannot estimate any real causal effects here because you haven't measured A0 and A minus one here. So you, you can do a regression and regress Y on A1, um, but you'll get a number that's a mixture of basically all of the backdoor paths between A1 and Y1. All of the correlation between the two comes from A at previous time points. And now if you add in confounding, you realize that uh, things get even worse. So you still have the problem of uh, the sort of backdoor paths through previous versions of A. And you also realize that C1 is actually not a confounder at all. It's only a proxy for confounders, right? Because it's, it's not on any backdoor paths itself but it's a proxy for other variables, which are. So if you could, oh, I forgot to mention this on the previous slide, if I click there, oh yeah. So the interesting thing here is that also the, your test of your null is also a test of whether A causes Y at any time point, which is of interest, I think. Uh, and then once you add confounding in, things get more complicated. Now you realize that I haven't even measured the right confounding variable. And the last little thing I'm going to end on here is that if we say, okay, I'm not doing a cross-sectional study, I'm going to do a longitudinal study, which again, people use in different ways. Here, I'm just meaning that, and this is something that I see people doing often, both in the literature and you know, uh, the, the students that I, I, I interact with. Um, all right, so they say, I'm going to take exposure at some previous time point, and I'm going to adjust for all of the things measured at the same time point which is better than taking confounders measured later. <laughs> so we're making a step in the right direction. Um, but you run into the same issues here. You know, one of the big things you need to ask yourself is like, which question am I trying to answer here? Am I trying to answer the question of what's the effect of intervening on A specifically at time zero on Y here? Because if that's true, then I have to adjust for A at time minus one. Right, because otherwise that's going to be a confound. There's a backdoor path from a zero, a minus one to y, and I also need to adjust for c minus one because that's also on backdoor paths. Where if I've measured the confounders cross sectionally or at the same time as the exposure, um, then it's it's acting like it was in the cross sectional study where it's well in this case it is on some backdoor paths, but it's also 
having to function as a proxy for some other confounders. The other interesting thing is if you could adjust for A equals minus one here, it would be much harder to satisfy positivity, but that's another, or it could be harder. Um, and the last little thing I'll mention was that if your question, which I've discussed with some people that, what question are people actually trying to answer when they're doing these studies? Are they trying to answer the question of A times zero? And sometimes I get the answer, no, what they're trying to do is estimate the sort of total effect of A times zero and also A times in the past. But you still, even if that's your question, you still won't get the right answer because you have not measured A at minus one, unless you know, there's a perfectly collinear or these are the same numbers, you know, this A and minus one could be different in the past. So you'll still get biased. And you also have the problem of you have to adjust for C at minus one here. All right, after all that, what is my conclusion? Well, my, I have sort of an even bigger conclusion than this is that I think, and I've heard this from other epidemiologists as well, is that, like I said, I use DAGs every day. I, I can't think with, without them. There are so many problems that I would not be able to think through if it wasn't for a DAG. So this is not meant to be a criticism of DAGs at all because there's, I can't think of anything better that we can use. But both in this case, and I think more generally, I know that when I teach DAGs, a lot of students fall into the trap immediately. Maybe it's my fault, I guess, for not emphasizing this enough, that the first thing they do is they draw the DAG that would need to be true for their analysis to be unbiased. That's the sort of, uh, you know, it's the, it's the intuitive, or not intuitive, but it's the, the, the thing you first, your reflex to do. And I think that this is a problem in epidemiology, and the problem could be that people are gaining confidence because they're drawing DAGs, but they're not drawing them properly. They're not really thinking about, you know, what are the things I haven't measured that I should be putting on here? And again, this in my from my students, this is my fault that I may be not putting enough emphasis on this. But really what I was talking about today is just another case of this. It's that we say I've measured exposure at time zero and outcome at time Y. And it's just, you know, this is what I have done before I was thinking about all this stuff is to forget about all the time in between. But it's important. You, you need to think about the time in between or else you can miss some important confounders. And when you do think about that time, my two sort of big points here that, that I hope you come away with is that sometimes you'll find biases. Sometimes you'll find places where, hey, if I hadn't have drawn this extra time point in that I haven't measured, I would have missed this bias. So that's the one on the left here. And also, once you start drawing things out with multiple time points, I've discovered that you often run into this thing where you say, okay, wait a second, now what's my question? <laughs> now that we're addressing time here uh, more explicitly, we realize that the question is not as clear as you originally thought it was. So that's it. I, I have my email and uh, Twitter handle here if you want to get mad at me and write me angry emails. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to answer all your questions here. You don't have to wait until I respond to an email. Thanks.